Our freedom of conscience and religion is being challenged by laws and regulations imposed by secular society. It's time to hear from the top Christian litigators in the nation who have come forward to tell us the truth and help us defend our faith. Hear ye, hear ye. All rise. Faith on Trial with Defender of the Faith, Deacon Mike Mano is in session. Welcome to Faith on Trial, where we explore the influence of law and society on people of faith. I'm Deacon Mike Mano, your host, and along with me is Gina Noll. Gina, how are you? I'm doing really well today. Um, glad to be at the program. This is one of our special weeks at Iowa Catholic Radio. Yeah, next week is going to be our semi-annual fundraiser, and uh, that starts uh, Monday. And uh, we should mention that if uh, people still are, or if people are interested in supporting the station, they can do so next week. Well, actually, they can start it right now by calling 515-223-1150 or go to iowacatholicradio.com, and there are some links on that page for a secure donation if you'd like to make That's it right. And we, we, right, and we really rely on the support of our, of our listeners, um, and because of their support, we're just growing. I think when you and I started this program oh so many years ago, there were just two, maybe, uh, or maybe three uh, frequencies, and now we're spreading out further in the state. Right, and we were uh, just FM, I think, when we began, and uh, and now we've got a number of uh, stations um, across the dial that carry the program and our programming, and so we're, I guess, truly becoming the uh, Iowa Catholic Radio Network. That's right. And it's all because of uh, the, the support of our listeners. So if right. um, like you, you have an opportunity speech. to support us this week, it's the semi-annual fundraiser, and you can make a secure contribution online at iowacatholicradio.com and hit the donate button or give us a call. Right. And uh, make the checks out to Gina Null, right? No, 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 <laughs> no. Iowa Catholic Radio. Although I, um, we broadcast a couple times over the weekend our programming, and I don't think there's anyone at the station to answer the phones this weekend. No, I, I, I don't so, know if there is, but uh, all on it will be online. You'll be able to get through online because that's automatic. Right. That's right. Yeah. And and we certainly... So speaking of faith on trial, what do we have today, Deacon Mike? Well, we have Christine Pratt from the First Liberty Institute on a police officer who lost his job because he expressed his belief in traditional marriage on a Facebook post. So here's a guy that goes out a personal Facebook post. Right. And so here's a guy that goes out defending uh, all the people of his community every day putting his life on the line. But on his Facebook page, he mentioned his belief in traditional marriage, and that's it. Can't be a cop anymore. Kind of sad. And then we're going to have on Aria Del Turco, who is an associate director of the Center for Religious Liberty with the Family Research Council on the increasing hostility to religion in America. That's right. Uh, the, you sent me um, to review a very hefty document that mm -hmm. they put together as they um, did the research on hostility towards religious organizations and um, I think even pregnancy centers throughout the United States because they said, it seems like we're under attack, but let's take a close look at it. So I'll be really anxious for Ariel to share her research with us. Yeah, we're going to talk about I know we talk about this a lot on the that on the show, and I always wonder, is this real or are we just nitpicking? But it's real, and Ariel's going to tell us how real. Yeah, and we're going to talk about how that uh, uh, report developed, why they did it, and and how they did it, and uh, and then what's the meaning of it, and what's some of their conclusions that they've come to. So that's going to be an interesting uh, little chat with us. Do you uh, have Wonderful. a prayer? To... Oh, I'm sorry. Do you have a prayer to begin? I do. I do. Uh, a prayer for peace today in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. Amen. God of peace, bring your peace to our violent world. Peace in the hearts of all men and women and peace among the nations of this earth. Turn to your way of love those whose hearts and minds are consumed with hatred. Strengthen us all in hope and give us the wisdom and the courage to work tirelessly for a world 
where true peace and love reign among the nations and in the hearts of all. Amen. Amen. Thank you, Gina. And we will be right back after these messages. You're listening to Faith on Trial on Iowa Catholic Radio. And we're back. We're with Christine uh, Pratt from First Liberty to talk about a police officer that lost his job over his beliefs in traditional marriage. Christine, uh, how are you today? Doing great. Thank you so much for having me. Good. Oh, certainly. We, we love having uh, people from First Liberty. You're so accommodating with our requests, and you're involved in so many different things there. <laughs> that it's hard to keep track of what you're doing. <laughs> All right. You are a an attorney with First Liberty, and uh, so you have knowledge of this case of the police officer, uh, Kersey, Jacob Ker- Kersey, right? Yes, Kersey. Have- yeah. Kersey, all right. Uh, and he was with uh, which de- police department was it? I have it somewhere. He here. is. He's with the Port Wentworth Police Department. It's okay. uh, right outside Savannah, Georgia. Okay, all right. And why don't you uh, give us a little bit of a lead up to the story? Who is this Jacob Kersey? Uh, Why was he a police officer? And what did he do that got him canned, I guess? Absolutely. So um, Jacob Kersey, at the time this all happened, was 19 years old. He was, for like his whole, almost his whole life, Um, wanted to be a police officer. And so as soon as he came of age, he, you know, enrolled in the academy. He went through the process and um, was a a great police officer. He, you know, his his supervisors talked about how they bragged on him all the time. Um, He always had great reviews, um, loved the job. He was very, very happy there. And, um, you know, part of the reason he grew up um, in somewhat of a tumultuous uh, home situation. And so he would have police officers visit his home when his parents were going through like a, a really difficult custody battle over him. And the police officers took this amazing interest in him and uh, mentored him, showed him um, just a lot of great kindness. So from a young age, he he was he was like, wow, I, I want to be a police officer. You know, this this job, um, you know, changed his life. And so he wanted to be that that sort of guiding light for others. Um, they were the role models it, it that he needed a, at the time. That's exactly right. Yeah. yeah and, exactly and, you know, right. as, as I visit with police officers that I know, uh, the, the ones, that, you know, and I don't think the ones in Iowa are any different than the ones every place else. Uh, they're really family people at heart. Yeah. 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 The the job requires such a degree of sacrifice and even personal risk that you're right. There's so many um, police officers you meet that they, they do it because they really want to help others. And right. it is a sacrifice. It's a vocation. It is. It is a dangerous yeah. one sometimes, so, um, but it's a vocation and, and we ought to honor them for yeah. it. But that I wasn't agree. what yeah. happened to this guy. Yeah. So um, it, it was just it was just about six months later. Jacob had posted on you know this was off duty on his personal social media. Um, he wrote a statement saying that he affirms traditional marriage. It was a paraphrase of Ephesians five, uh, where he said, you know, Christ is marriage represents Christ in the church, and that's why there cannot be any homosexual marriage. That's what he said. Mm-hmm. And a little while later, somehow, I guess, you know, somebody was connected to him on his social media through work. And um, his supervisors um, set out first, they they demanded he take it down. And Jacob was really taken aback because this was, this had nothing to do with his job. It's just something that he did on his personal time. His, he he doesn't identify, you know, he's not like, it's not a, a police officer Twitter, it's it's just him his, as did, a personal citizen. Did they imply that uh-huh. this violated any uh, police rules? Like, uh, you know, we can't uh, let people know that we have a station full of God-fearing men and women. <laughs> you know, yes. So what they said was that it. it this is this is a, a, the um, the quote that they said. It's as if you said the N word. Oh. That, that the G is, word is now like <laughs> the N word, right? God, you can't mention yeah. God or what he. All right, right. <laughs> this is, gets yeah, beyond belief, yeah. so but right. Like, 
Right. So, so somebody who holds to a, a belief about uh, an institution that's been around for thousands of years, many, many people of various religious faiths hold this understanding of marriage, the importance of traditional marriage and the family. Uh, that person is like a racist, is precisely yeah. what they said. Um, All right. So you can, it, it, it you, would, you can believe that you can turn a little boy into a little girl, but you can't believe in God's word. Right, right. That, that's the so, state of, you know, the, I think, a, society today. Yeah, it's it's very telling, yeah. right? So, um, you know, Jacob felt like they were telling him that he needed, you know, it felt like a moment where he had to deny Christ, right? That, that if you, they, they all, they, they gathered around him, they pulled him into meetings and they said, you know, this, this makes the police station look bad, look bad. People are going to think that you can't treat people respectfully. They they think that um, you're not going to do the right thing um, if you ever do come into contact with someone from the LGBTQ community. Uh, we can't trust you to do your job properly just because of these beliefs you have about traditional marriage. And so, um, those are Christian you know, beliefs, <laughs> by the way. <laughs> you know that you you treat people fairly and you honor people right. and respect them. Right. That I guess that passed over the higher-ups. Right, right. So um, Jacob said, I'm not going to deny this basic part of my Christian beliefs. I'm not going to give up uh, my faith, you know, to, to serve my job. I shouldn't have to choose between my job and my faith. In fact, you know, if you if you talk to him, he says, you know, my faith informs my job. Like, it's because of his faith that he wants to serve others in this capacity as a police officer. So he wouldn't do it. <laughs> he just said, yeah. no, I'm not going to take it down. <laughs> and then, um, so they call him in. They said, turn in, you know, your keys to the squad car, turn in everything that belongs to the city. Um, and they, they, they put him on leave and they, they launched an investigation to determine whether, you know, he needed to be sanctioned. Wow. And so he, you know, initially when they, marched him in, and they had this uh, serious meeting with all these officials present who had told him he'd done a very bad thing, and he, you know, he's a very bad uh, example. Um, he really felt like he had been fired. Um, when he found out that it was just Lee, it wasn't just, that he wasn't, like, actually terminated at mm -hmm. that point. Um, he, you know, it, it really, it just, it was a very scary, intense moment for him. Um, so, yeah, in the end, um even even after the investigation was concluded, what what they said in the end of the investigation was, well, you know, we're not we haven't decided we're not exactly deciding yet to discipline you. That could change at any time in the future, but for right now, we're not, um, you know, we're we're not firing you. Uh, but if you ever do this again, we will fire you. And so then Jacob's like left with this choice that going forward, it just wasn't clear what he would be able to say or not say as a private citizen off duty. And he just felt like, you know, the, especially his supervisors who had come down on him so hard like this, that it, it wasn't going to work. So he, he resigned in the end and felt like he just didn't have a choice that he couldn't, you know, be a Christian police officer. He had to, um, you those know, are, make those sure are the kind of police officers anything. we want. <laughs> you know, really, that's what yeah, we want. We want Christian police officers because uh, they're grounded yeah. properly if they're if they're true Christians. All right, now who were these people that were investigating him? Was it just the uh, police department, or were there outside investigators in? Was the mayor and the city council involved? How how deep did that go? Uh, to my knowledge, it's just uh, his supervisors within the police department. I don't. I'm not aware of it rising above just okay. the police department. All right. So uh, he's out now, right? He he turned in his badge and says, "I can't, I can't operate this." Yeah, way. yeah. He's still praying about what to do next, All and right. you know, we wrote a demand letter to the police station. We explained to them, "This isn't hard. We're not pushing the envelope or asking for some huge thing. We're simply asking them." to follow what the Constitution requires. It's a very, very clear, easy legal requirement that um, even public employees, when they engage in private speech, they have free speech rights and free exercise rights. 
so it, it's just very clear here that Jacob's speech was protected under the Constitution. And we've asked the police department to issue a public apology and also to revise their policy to make it constitutional, to make it um, you know, respectful for other police officers. Jacob is very concerned about um, other police officers you know, who are still at their jobs who can't, you know, they feel like they can't be a Christian police officer or, or Jewish police officer, you know, right. any, you know, someone of any faith that they have to be this like weird, secular, atheistic um, type of person that the, the Constitution does not require that at all. Is, is he still um, without pay? Um, yes. To my understanding, yes. Okay. Mm-hmm. So, um, <laughs> literally, the, he, he's starving now unless he wants to go out and get another job. He doesn't have any income. So, um, mm-hmm. um, w- uh, now, you sent a letter. Uh, if the police department responds inappropriately to you, what is the next step? Is, is this headed for a court of law? Well, currently, all options are on the table. Okay. We're still assessing what next steps will be, and a lot of it will depend on how the police station responds. Mm-hmm. Um, we have not heard back from them yet. Uh, I think it's a little crazy <laughs> that oh, oh, it is. Yeah. Uh, they, <laughs> they. I mean, like I said, it's a very easy, clear, legal situation. They have clearly violated the Constitution. I think first semester um, law school, but, yeah. you find that out. Yeah. Yeah. yeah it doesn't yeah. take much. Okay, but you, the um, go ahead, Gina. Oh, go ahead. Well, Christine, the um, the the police department had mentioned to him that the whole reason that this occurred was because it was offensive, and uh, my question really is who uh, who was offended? Um, it uh, it's, it would seem to me that if it was the leadership of the police department that was offended uh, by his religious remarks. Uh, when do we take into consideration the uh, offense of um, the Christians who would find the opposite, um, the defense of gay marriage mm-hmm. as offensive? Uh, how does that, how do we balance those? And I know at one point the city was talking about this is a matter of uh, separation of church and state. And if you could talk a little bit about the we encounter this quite a bit on the show. The diff- how this really isn't any kind of uh, separation of church and state issue. Sure. Yeah. Yeah. I, I think you rightly recognize um, just the imbalance of, of concerns, and and it's it's, it's absolutely improper um, under the free exercise and establishment clause uh, jurisprudence. It's improper for the government to bit hostility toward religion, religious beliefs, religious expression. And um, that's exactly what we're seeing here. Um, and, you know, it's it, this, this idea of what they're describing as separation of church and state, um, it doesn't... So what I'll explain is um, when a public official, so that, you know, he, he works for the government, when he's on duty, he speaks for the government. He represents the government. And so in that instance, under the free speech um, clause, he doesn't have the ability to speak as freely. Um, when he's wearing the uniform and he's driving his car and he's right, he's, he's operating according to his official duties. Um, but when he's off duty and when he's engaging in private speech, he's a private citizen and he has the right to speak in those instances and he has the right to exercise his religion. Um, but what you see, it's very interesting. Um, you see a total misunderstanding. We saw this in our Coach Kennedy case, which was uh, decided by the Supreme Court last term. Congratulations, and, you know, by the, the way. Yes. Thanks. Thanks. Well, yeah. And we, we, you know, the Coach Kennedy case completely answers the situation. This never should have happened to Jacob. So it's, it's just frustrating that you're waiting for, you know, this important legal case to come trickling down to, you know, other schools and the police departments and public libraries or wherever, you know, discrimination against religious people are, is happening. Um, but, it, you know, the school in the Coach Kennedy case, you have a, a public school coach. He wants to kneel privately for a very brief, silent prayer on the 50-yard line. Um, and the school is concerned, oh, well, people are going to see you. They, they know that you're praying. 
And he's like, I'm not making, I'm not asking anyone else to pray. I'm not forcing anyone. It's, he is a break. The game is over. Other people are making personal phone calls. They're making, you know, uh, restaurant reservations. They're talking to friends and family. He wanted to talk to God and during his break. And, um, you know, the, it's amazing to watch the school district fight that tooth and nail. And then you even even the, um, the upper, the appellate court in the Ninth Circuit had so much difficulty understanding that it's okay, especially under the First Amendment. The First Amendment protects a person's right to, to I mean, that's, it's an important part of a person's humanity that they exercise religion, that they're thinking about God, that the reason that Coach Kennedy was coaching was for God. And part of the reason, you know, Jacob, the, the, the fundamental reason Jacob was a police officer was because of his faith and how he wanted to serve God. He, that was a service he gave to God by serving as a police officer. Um, but yeah, you see this misunderstanding all the time and people will use the establishment clause as an excuse, trying to banish this kind of religious expression, um, especially by public officials, but it's, it's totally wrong. And it's important that, you know, for our society to come back to um, a healthier place uh, a healthier culture, uh, healthier families, healthier people. Um, people need to connect with God. They need to search for greater meaning. They need to search for morality. I, I know I'm preaching to the choir here, um, but it's it's so important, and, and it just goes to show you how powerful that is because uh, people try to stop it. They try to to, to put a halt to that. That's right, and I, th- I think you're very right in uh, making the division between private speech that an individual does on his own time, and public speech that a, that a public employee is engaged in when he is doing his job. I remember years ago there was a case, I think it was out of California, and it involved uh, deputy uh, prosecutors, uh, assistant uh, prosecutors out there, who were saying one thing when they were out, uh, and it may not have been the actual attorneys themselves, but they were they were engaged in some type of, religious activity uh, off in off hours, and when they came to work, then uh, they had to kind of toe the company line then. They couldn't say certain things or do certain things, and the uh, I, I guess it was the, the attorney's office, uh, the attorney general's office or somebody, was trying to prevent them from speaking out of the office anything then other than that they could say in the office. And I think that's an important distinction to make, that when a police officer has on his uniform and he's riding around in his squad car and he's interacting with people as a police officer, there can be limits on what he can say. I mean, that's that's appropriate, and that's been held by the courts. Mm-hmm. But when he is off duty, when he takes off that uniform and he's in his own private domain or whatever he is doing privately, he has the full backing of the First Amendment to say and believe what he wants. Mm-hmm. Yeah. That's right. Christine, has, um, has Officer Pratt had any um, outpouring of support, perhaps, from his community? Or yes. are they staying yes, away for, out of the fray? Um, yeah, he said he's had an amazing outpouring of support, you know, from police officers who have contacted him from all over the country. Um, many, many officers saying that they agree with him. They they have the same beliefs as him that, you know, that ultimately, um, you know, forced him out of his job. Um, and there were a lot of people that contacted him and said, I don't agree with your beliefs, but you should have the right to say that in your, in your own, on your own time. Mm. And so that that has been incredibly encouraging to Jacob as he's gone through this. Um, and, of course, his friends and family are very supportive as well. Certainly. Now, we're running a little bit out of time here, but I want to give you a chance to let our listeners know how they can follow you and what's going on at First Liberty and uh, perhaps even make a donation to First Liberty, although we're competing with you next week because we're raising our <laughs> have our own fundraiser going. Uh, but how do we get a hold of you? How do we follow what First Liberty is doing? Because I know you are involved in a mess of stuff there. Yeah, we are, yeah. And we have all of our cases on our website. Very easy to to learn about what's going on uh, around the country. 
Um, so our website is First Liberty, F I R S T, liberty.org. Right. Um, if anyone's having issues at work or just exercising their faith, we have uh, like a, a form on our website. They can, you know, reach out to us and we would love to hear from them and see if there are other people we can help. Everything we do is pro bono, all legal services are provided free of charge. Um, and it really enables us not to worry about who's asking for help. Like, oh, do you have the money for this? Mm-hmm. We can just take any case that deserves, um, you know, deserves to be fought for. Yeah, when I look at my bank account, I think I did all my legal work in my career as pro bono. <laughs> I didn't seem to get much out of it. But, <laughs> but no. And, and, in heaven. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> retirement benefits are nice. Um but it it is important that we uh, that we do continue to support these organizations that are out there fighting for our rights, regardless of whether we have the ability to pay or not. And uh, those people who are making donations to First Liberty and other organizations like it are 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 are, are doing God's work to help maintain the religious liberty of the people of the United States. That's right. Well, thank you so much. Certainly. Yeah, and once again, the website. FirstLiberty.org, just in case someone missed it. No, that's fine. We want to get it in as many times as we can. Christine Pratt, thank you for the time you've given us today. We certainly appreciate it, and good luck with this case. And uh, and our blessings on you and all the other attorneys that are working with you. Wonderful. Thank you so much. Blessings to you, too. Certainly. And uh, we've got to take a break right now. We will be right back after these messages. You're listening to Faith on Trial on Iowa Catholic Radio. And we're back here listening to Faith on Trial and Iowa Catholic Radio. We are now with Ariel Del Turco, who is an associate uh, director of the Center for Religious Liberty at the Family Research Center. And she is the author of a report on growing hostilities against uh, religious institutions throughout the United States. And Ariel, we want to welcome you to our program. Thank you so much for having me. It's great being with you. Certainly, certainly. I um, want to talk a little bit, uh, maybe a little bit about your background, how you got involved in something like this, and, um, and, and, and why. Yeah, so I have been um, uh, doing religious liberty research for four years. Most of that has been focused internationally, but mm-hmm. as things are heating up here at home, uh, my attention has turned uh, more towards domestic And I wanted to take on a project like this, uh, which captures what we term acts of hostility against churches, uh, because we were seeing or what we perceived uh, was a rise just in incidences in the news, just things we heard about on social media or by word of mouth from contacts, um, that we just heard more incidences of these bizarre attacks against churches, these weird vandalism, sometimes very uh, dangerous acts of arson. Uh, And so we really wanted to put numbers to that um, to answer the question, okay, well, it seems to be on the rise, but are these things actually on the rise? So we looked at the past five years, and the answer we came to is basically yes, these acts are rising uh, just over the last several years in the United States. Hey, we... um just finished an interview with a a person from First Liberty who's representing a police officer who was, uh, uh, I guess, pushed out of his job as a police officer, young man, uh, hasn't been on the force that long, because of a thing he posted on his own Facebook page about traditional marriage. When you were doing, I know you were focusing in uh, your report here on vandalism and and things like that, hostilities against institutions. But did you run across much of this, or were you even looking for this? To just kind of put it in another bucket for another day. Yeah, well, that is really interesting. Uh, so one of the things that we were looking at, and we can't assess this perfectly because we don't know what's in uh, the heart of each individual that's going out and committing these acts against churches. Uh, But one of our questions was, okay, what's motivating people? What's motivating this uh, rise in hostility, partially against Christianity as a whole, uh, but also against churches, which is this very visible uh, 
uh, representation of Christianity that uh, used to inspire uh, a, a bit more respect in the United States, mm-hmm. or I would at least like to think so, some reverence, even by people that uh, weren't Christian. Uh, so I think there is a tie. I, I think these topics are related. Um, it comes down a lot of times to these social issues. Uh, people will have the attitude like, oh, yeah, what, we're, we're fine with Christians. You can be Christian and go to church, whatever. Uh, but as soon as our Christian beliefs um, articulate a position that uh, they don't agree with, especially in these hot-button cultural issues like marriage, mm-hmm. like abortion, um, like uh, the transgender issue, uh, when our faith impacts that, uh, then they just have very little tolerance at all. And I just think it's a symptom of how our co- a culture has been captured by the sexual revolution, uh, and anything that goes against those dogmas, which Christianity certainly does, uh, they just don't have any tolerance for. You know, it seems interesting that every time we hear one of these arguments, uh, they talk about uh, you're you're trying to, uh, uh, you know, enforce your religious beliefs on us, or you're, uh, you know, you're dragging uh, religion into politics or something like that. I think it's really it's the opposite way. It, what is happening is morality is being uh, immorality is being foisted on us, and I think the church has every right to speak back against that because that's not turning these things into political issues. That's taking moral issues and answering them. You're absolutely right. I mean, this is the role of the church. Uh, to, to tell the truth from about God's Word, uh, about uh, what Christian tradition has always believed, regardless of how the culture around us changes. So it's a really uh, a silly notion for uh, much of secular culture to have that, oh, the Church should adopt uh, our beliefs. We finally know what's right. Everyone in the past about uh, over thousands of years of tradition about marriage, they're all wrong. Mm. (laughs) Suddenly, we see the light, we know it's right, and the church should follow us. And I have a lot of compassion for people like this police officer. I mean, I have a little bit of privilege here because it's it's my job to talk about these issues. It's Mm. my job to talk about religious freedom and uh, to talk about policy from a biblical worldview. But for many American Christians who are just uh, working at their uh, normal job as a police officer in the corporate world, um, in the public schools, uh, I think they feel increasingly afraid to be labeled um, as a strong Bible-believing Christian that uh, believes God's Word on these topics. And that's it's a blatant attack on religious freedom and our ability to um, live out and practice our faith. You know, you, you, this covers about five years, did you say, of um, life in America? Yeah, so over five years. Um, actually, it covers from January 2018 just through September of 2022, which was mm. our reporting period. Right. Um, so we found 420 acts of hostility against churches. And over that period, um, there was about three times, almost three times more acts of hostility in 2022 than there was in 2018. Mm-hmm. So I think that's a pretty stark increase. Yeah. Now, when you're talking about these incidences, you're talking about incidents that you can find publicly. Um, did you make an estimate on how many instances go without reporting? I mean, how many priests or ministers would say, hey, I don't want any publicity on this. Just let it go. We'll you know, clean up the spray paint or whatever, fix the windows. Yeah, you're absolutely right. So our report covers incidences that were already documented, typically by local news, but sometimes the church did a good job documenting as well. Um, So we really believe that this report just scratches the surface Mm -hmm. because we heard from, for example, one pastor, um, he has an incident that's um, documented and we've included it in the report, but we were talking to him after the report was released, and he's like, yeah, since that time, I've had uh, over a dozen more attacks of vandalism. Uh, So uh, for everything that's documented in this report, just think about all the things that could that are out there that are not documented for any number of reasons, including just uh, a church might not have connections to local news, might not even think to report it, it might just be... uh, or, or they don't want to encourage copycats. 
coming back. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That yeah could be. That's true. How long did it take you to put this report together? And and speaking of the report, let's tell people where they can find it because it's on your website. Yeah, so they can find it on our homepage, uh, frc.org. Um, it's called uh, Hostility Against Churches is on the Rise in America. Uh, and this took several months. We began working on this um, in the summer, around July, and we finished it in December when the report was released. Okay. All right. Gina, uh, you were quiet out there. I didn't know. Yeah, if you Ariel, I was fascinated by this report because... I had been seeing, I know um, Catholic Vote has a tracker where um, churches and uh, pregnancy centers can self-report if there's been an attack. And they show that there was quite a large uptick uh, following the um, release or the leak of the Dobbs opinion. Does your study show any relationship to uh, an increase in attacks against these churches um, since the Dobbs uh, leak? Yeah, that's a really great point. I'm glad you brought that up. Uh, And it's one of the most disturbing findings from our report, actually, this uh, connection between times of heightened political tension in the U.S. and a spike in acts of hostility against churches. And this was the most prominent by far um, around the time of the Dobbs leak in in the following months. Uh, So just last year, um, from the time of the Dobbs leak in May uh, through September, we identified 57 specifically pro-abortion acts of hostility. So more actually might have been inspired by that, uh, but these were acts where they were specifically uh, uh, either talking about abortion uh, in their messages uh, with spray paint and vandalism. It was a direct tie to abortion. So that's a that's 57. That's, that's a lot. That's a lot. Uh, that's a lot of churches experiencing uh, the heat and the brunt of this political battle in a really concerning way. Well, and apparently the Dobbs decision was also uh, an impulse for the, uh, the Justice Department to up their ante on pro-life counselors and that that are sitting outside of uh, uh, abortion clinics, uh, like Mark Houck, who was just, of course, acquitted in, in Philadelphia of the charges that he was blocking an entrance. But uh, uh, the assistant uh, attorney general of the United States uh, mentioned it in a speech that we're upping this stuff because of the Dobbs decision. Mm-hmm. Shows a little yeah, bit. that's a really powerful admission. Mm-hmm, yeah. mm-hmm. A, a little bit of bad faith on, on her it- part, too. Ariel, did you track any kind of law enforcement of, um, you know, um, how many of these cases of vandalism and damage were prosecuted or made arrests in the cases? So that was beyond the scope of the report. Uh, Thankfully, I would say a majority of the cases that we looked at, um, they were under investigation. However, uh, that could be because they were already being publicly reported. They had already uh, risen to like a high profile, high level of attention. And I think for the churches out there that um, just really go under the radar and unnoticed, uh, I, I would be interested to see how thoroughly uh, law enforcement uh, is tracking down the people that are committing these uh, one thing to know is that clearly people are not being deterred from attacking uh, churches. Uh, it's on the increase. It's not decreasing. So that in and of itself, I think, is alarming and deserves uh, more attention from law enforcement because we want to discourage this behavior. There there seems, as I'm looking at the studies from all over, um, there seems to be a lessening in religious beliefs in this country. Uh, I think we're now to the point where they're under 50 percent of the people actually attend a church. Uh, and, of course, you know, our, one of our former presidents had declared this a post-Christian society now. So what do you see any correlation between the loss of kind of religious identity among so many people and the violence against churches? Yeah, I think the rise in secularism uh, is very closely related to all of this. Uh, even just the lack of reverence that we're seeing for church buildings, um, that 
it to me is symptomatic of a culture that just doesn't understand religion, doesn't understand why it's important, doesn't understand why it's important to religious people, uh, just has no respect for uh, religious imagery or buildings or institutions, uh, and not only doesn't have respect for them, but might even like view them as harmful, view them as uh, institutions that are out to uh, attack our uh, rights to do whatever we want with our bodies. Uh, I I think that's a very wrong way to look at it, but that's how some of these people are thinking. Uh, So, yeah, I I think the decline in Christian faith in America and the rise in secularism, uh, it's giving way to so many consequences, and these attacks on churches are just one. You know, I don't want to give away my age or anything here, but I remember when I was a kid uh, and I would be downtown, uh, I would see nuns walk down the street and grown men would tip their hats to them. Uh, Bums sitting on the side of the the road would stand up when they went by. There was a certain respect for religion and religious people, and I see that as kind of all gone now. Mm. Yeah, that, that's, a, that's a beautiful image, uh, and it's in America. That was in that was in 1864 yeah. that I'm talking about. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> no, I'm not quite that old, but uh, and I didn't know yeah. Abraham Lincoln. <laughs> oh well, yeah, that is it, right. We want to have a culture that truly does respect people. The left often talks about. Uh, respecting our differences, but they don't often care when it comes to our religious differences. Um, I had an incident where I I went to the March for Life uh, several weeks ago now, Um, and after the crowd had dispersed and I was walking back to my uh, workplace, uh, I had just a pro-life sign. It just said uh, something really simple like, choose choose life. but that warranted uh, someone stopped their car on the side of the road and uh, flipped me off and cussed me out. So it was, it was quite a dramatic scene. Yeah. Uh, but to me, it just shows the vitriol that's out there for um, some of our very core beliefs. It, it's really sad. Yeah, it is. It is. And uh, unfortunately, that's what we have to put up with these days. Is that the police officer that we talked about in the first part of our program knows that all too well. And there are too many people out there. That, that know it because they've been involved in it. I mean, you know, people are losing their jobs, uh, or being silenced or not getting promotions or whatever it is um, because of their religious beliefs. That's, that's what we call white martyrism. You know, a blood, mm-hmm. if you're blood martyr, it's red. <laughs> but if it's an economic thing, it's white. And it's happening all over. And, uh, and unfortunately, uh, as you point out in your, in your report, this is happening in many times in violence against uh, churches and church buildings and, and pastors, too. I understand there have been pastors that have been uh, attacked. Yeah, and the effect is far bigger than, than just the specific cases, mm-hmm. whether it's a specific case of someone that gets fired because of their beliefs or even a specific case of a church being attacked. Uh, a broader problem that all of these incidences contribute to um, is just this chilling effect on on our free speech, on um, how comfortable Christians feel uh, saying they're Christians or uh, praying in their workplace or sharing their faith. It all contributes to an environment where Americans just feel less free to be a Christian, and I, I think that's intentional by the anti-Christian forces out there. Mm-hmm. Uh, but it's something we really need to press against. Um, I always talk about how religious freedom requires not just legal support, but cultural support. And part of the way that we build this cultural support is just by um, practicing our faith, by living out our beliefs, um, even when that people will uh, criticize us or, um, yeah, we, we, we need to be bold about um, yeah, praying in public, identifying as Christians, we can't let this um, chill our speech or um, affect how we behave. Yeah, part of it is an intimidation factor. Uh, yeah. We're being intimidated. And uh, last week we had on uh, the uh, FBI whistleblower who blew the story on the FBI investigating the Latin mass Catholics. And uh, again, it's all an, an intimidation thing. And whether it comes from the government, it comes from the DOT, it comes from private individuals, it's an intimidation factor to try and move you out of your 
of where you are at in your beliefs and force you to shut up. Yeah, and it's widespread. Mm -hmm. I mean, just in our attack, we identified these acts in 45 states plus D.C., um, and you might think that they, these incidents gravitate towards blue states, but that's actually not true. It's nationwide, and uh, it correlates more with our population size. So uh, it, it's inescapable, and it's only growing. Yeah, yeah. And unfortunately, we're going to have to leave it there because we're running out of time. Once again, if you will tell us how to see, find the, uh, uh, your report, the website. Yeah, uh, you can go to our homepage at frc.org. Very good. Thank you very much. Uh, we certainly appreciate your time, and uh, we will probably be talking to somebody over there again shortly. Thanks for having me on. All right. Area, thank you. And we thank will be you. right back after these messages. You're listening to Faith on Trial on Iowa Catholic Radio. And we're back. You're listening to Faith on Trial on Iowa Catholic Radio. Gina, interesting program once again. It was... Uh, Wonderful. The problem is, I we didn't have much hope in this particular program. <laughs> what <laughs> well, are we going to do about we're, all of these? We're, things? we're laying out the problem, you know, and you've got to recognize it before you can solve it. So um, that's right. That, that's what we're doing, and we're we're doing. I think our it's best. really interesting um, that this uh, officer Kiersey mm -hmm. um, quit his job, so he resigned. Mm -hmm. And then he's able to file a complaint against them while he's currently not employed. But I, I guess it's not a lawsuit, and they're not looking for any uh, compensation for him at this point anyway. Um, but they can still continue the dialogue under the, the I, Yeah, I think what it sounds like is, is, they, is they sent this officer uh, out of the station with his tail between his legs, you know, uh, bad boy, you know, go think about what you just did. And uh, and he can't comply with their demand, which was to take his post down and and to, and to do uh, certain things that he found uh, uh, objectionable. And I think he's in the right. So do, yeah, right. So do, as a, as an attorney, maybe you know this. Can you uh, file a suit if you? I mean, do well, there's you have something any, there's something called a constructive um, discharge. That's where you don't uh, you don't actually fire the person. Uh, but you make uh, work so untenable that they won't come back. And uh, okay, and so the lawyers do have some so, sort so of they, a case yeah, right, them. right. They, they would have a, they would have some grounds there. Now, what they can prove is you know, we don't know. But anyway, let's. Uh, well, let's, I think. Oh, go ahead. I think that's helpful for our listeners. Yeah, yeah that's yeah. very helpful, and we're able to bring this information each week to our listeners um, for and, free. And here we, at you're right, and we Catholic can bring it, video. and we can bring it to them because uh, that uh, the generosity of our listeners, and we have another fundraiser, our semi-annual fundraiser next week. And if you want to make a pledge, you can call it in at five one five. 223-1150 or go to iowacatholicradio.com and you'll find a secure location on the site where you can uh, donate uh, securely. And I think right now That's we're right. And pretty much out of time. <laughs> so let's do our defense. Oh, yes. Or, yeah, yeah. St. Michael the Archangel, defend us in battle. Be our protection against the wickedness and snares of the devil. May God rebuke him, we humbly pray. And do thou, o Prince of the Heavenly Host, by the power of God, Thrust into hell Satan and all the evil spirits who roam about the world, seeking the ruin of souls. Amen. That's Amen. it for today. Thanks to everybody for listening. Remember, next week is the Carathon, uh, or what we used to call the Carathon, fundraiser right now. And you can make your secure donations at iowacatholicradio.com. Until then, uh, have a blessed and peaceful week. Our freedom of conscience and religion is being challenged by laws and regulations imposed by secular society. Faith on Trial with Defender of the Faith, Deacon Mike Mano. Faith on Trial on Iowa Catholic Radio, iowacatholicradio.com, and the Iowa Catholic Radio app.